I'm tired too. I'm tired of being tired. I'm tired of being this way. I'm tired of hearing us Christians being all talk and no walk. I'm sick of it. I don't know if it's weird for you guys to hear your youth minister say this, but everybody on staff, I mean, we're not perfect. Might be weird. But <laughs> if I'm going to be honest with you guys. I'm going through a really tough time right now in my life. I'm 23 years old. I uh, just graduated from college. I'm trying to figure out how to be an adult. Um, the hardest thing about this is I feel, and it's perfect right now for this time because, I mean, we're trying to pick a new president for the next four years, and I feel like I'm in the same, but I feel like I'm in the same presidential election between uh, God and Satan. I feel like both sides are actively pursuing me, but only one side truly wants me. And I see the side that God wants and the, that God offers me, and, and I, I want it, and I need it. We need God's side. But then I look at, I look at what Satan's offering me. And Satan, I mean, Satan, he's giving me the world. He's giving me riches, women. He's giving me everything. I mean, with the Internet, you know, it's right there at the palm of our hands. And so I'm struggling with that. Satan doesn't come to you and red horns and a tail, but it comes to you and everything that you desire most. And so that's why it's so difficult for us to decipher, you know, what's God, what's Satan. Obviously, there's two huge differences. Uh, but I, I feel like I've grown comfortable right now in my life. I feel like I'm, you know, I got baptized, and that was the goal. Like, the goal was for us to get baptized, and we're done. And, and we think that's it. But we've grown complacent with that idea. We think... Baptism is done. You know, f most days I feel like the boy David. I feel like God has chosen me to go fight Goliath in the Valley of Ella. And I feel like I know God is right behind me. I know God is right there. And then other days I feel like now King David, where I'm lusting after some guy's wife. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just tired of my imperfections weighing down my soul. I'm tired of not being the best version of me that God wants. But I, f I feel like maybe that's everybody. I mean, maybe I'm not alone. Maybe everybody in here, maybe a few people in here are tired of the way that maybe you are. I am. But so if we ignore that, if we ignore what God has done for us, then we're ignoring his entire purpose. Does anybody know who Michael Jordan is? Get a show of hands. Yeah, he is the best basketball player to have ever played basketball. And he's only that good because he came from the University of North Carolina. So, <laughs> Dean Smith did great with him. But Michael Jordan, if you guys don't know, I did a project on Michael Jordan when I was in second grade. And, yeah, I, I love Carolina. It's my dad's fault. So, Michael Jordan, if you guys didn't know this, he was cut three times from his junior varsity basketball team. So the greatest basketball player in all of history of basketball was cut from his JV team. That means, if you don't know sports, being cut is not good. So <laughs> he was cut three times. And so he thought, you know, he was a loser. I mean, and look at him now. But I got a couple quotes from the great Michael Jordan. And in one quote, he says, I've failed over and over again in my life, and that's why I succeed. And then the last quote is, some people want it to happen, some wish it would happen, others make it happen. So this war that we're talking about, we're talking about make war. In order to make something, you have to do something. And in that video that we watched before that about the comfortableness of our lives, that's what we're trying to break. So if you want to follow along with me, I'm going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. And Paul writes this. He says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. 
Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and I make it my slave, so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. So this race that Paul is talking about is our spiritual life. You know, if I don't know if any of you guys run marathons. We've got a couple in here that are just may have four lungs. I don't know, but they're incredible when it comes to running. But if you know about marathons, it's a long distance, so you don't want to sprint. You don't want to, if the finish line is straight back here, you don't want to run to Chicken Express and then down to this Laguna Madre and then back over. You want to go straight for the goal. And that's what Paul is talking about. And in this war, that's what it is. This war is not a sprint. This isn't something that's going to happen overnight. But this war is going to cause great days. And in those great days, we need to share that with God. And obviously, with war, it's going to cause horrible days. You're going to have probably the worst days of your life in the middle of this spiritual battle that you're in. And instead of going to our sins and being comfortable where something goes wrong, we hide back and we put our blanket on, we need to step out. Give that to God. Don't be embarrassed of what it is. God already knows. He wants you to come to him. He wants you to make war. Everybody watch TV in here? If you do then you've probably seen the commercial about the Febreze air effects, and that, the ones that you plug into your car. So if you've ever owned a dog or a cat or a teenager, you understand the smell that comes out with it. So there's a new word out there called nose blindness. And for me, I've got a dog. And when we go to the lake, we get back in the car, I don't smell anything. But when people get into my car, I'm sure they smell like a nasty gym bag, a wet dog, like all this junk uh, that I haven't cleaned out. But it's normal to me because I'm constantly in my car. And for new people to come into my car, they get to smell the smell all over again. And I feel like we do that a lot. Let's be honest with each other. We, I think a lot of us do that. A lot of Christians. I'm not calling anybody out. I'm saying Christians in general. Christians down the road, Christians in a different state, I think we all Febreze ourselves on Sunday morning. You know, we have a terrible week at, at school or work or something, and then we just spray our Febreze so everybody thinks, oh, yeah, we're happy. You know, life is good. Uh, my kids, they woke up on time, and we got them dressed and fed. I mean, life is good. But that's really not always the case. And I, I feel like we do that a lot. And... If you read the gospel, you understand that even the disciples did that. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 14, and the disciples are in a boat, and everybody's heard the story of Jesus walking on the water. Uh, but we've got the quotes up on, so you can follow on the projectors. But Jesus had just fed 5,000 people. And immediately, he comes right back at the disciples with his own miracle. And I, I think Jesus does this on purpose. I, I don't think I'm fully uh, set that the disciples understand who Jesus is. So in Matthew 14, 25 through 31, it says, Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. Okay, so Jesus is walking on the lake, on water. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Jesus replies, Come. So if you saw somebody walking on water in the middle of the storm, your first thought would be, it's a ghost, grim reaper, something, I'm about to die. And, and Peter understands that, and I think Peter thought he was about to die. So he called out to Jesus, and he said, Jesus, if it's you, tell me to come to you. And Peter's like, all right, I'm done. Jesus knows that I care about him enough that I'll ask him. But Jesus, is why I love Jesus, says, doesn't say, hey, great, thanks, Peter, thank you for asking about me. But Jesus says, Come. Come out. Step out of your boat and step on to water and come walk to me. I have in the past have always asked God either one for a dirt bike or 
ask God to show himself. And I'm pretty sure I'm about 100% everybody in here has asked God to show himself at some point in their life. And, and I think that's what Peter is kind of doing. We can all relate to Peter. You know, we've all asked God, show us. If you show yourself to me, I won't commit this sin. God, if you show yourself to me, I'll know that you're real. I'll believe you even harder. Well, if you read the Old Testament, God has shown himself enough. And guess what? It doesn't help. Because we are too naive to understand that God is in our presence already. So we need to stop asking God to show himself. He's already here. We need to step out. We need to answer God. God is always telling us to come out. God is saying, I've taken 99 steps towards you. All you have to do is take one towards me. But we write it off because we don't want to. We don't want to get out of the comfort of what we're doing to go out and follow him. And so the issue that we're talking about complacency. And the issue with complacency, it's not a lack of divine intervention, it's a lack of human intervention. We're not doing enough. God is doing so much in our lives, and we're not doing anything. Now, a lot of us are, don't get what, when I say we're not doing anything, that doesn't mean we're just sitting around. I mean, our church just raised over 8,500 items for a food drive. We are moving, we are making war. So we're on the right track. But I love it that Jesus didn't just acknowledge Peter for asking to show himself, but that Jesus told him to come. Come out to me. Complacency and comfort is not our goal. And if you believe that being comfortable is our goal, then maybe you should go back and read the gospel or something. I don't know, but we're about to rock your world. But our comfort and our insecurities have built us this nest called complacency. And I feel like a lot of Christians have built this nest and we just ask God to just come back, back and forth day after day to take care of us. And there is a little of that in our walk with God because he is our shepherd, like Adam has been talking about. But we're not meant to live in this nest. We're meant to live out in the world where there is brokenness, where there is conflict and risk. And that's why our gospel is the gospel of reincarnation. I mean, God came to us so that we could go out into the world with his life. So how do we make sure that we don't lose our opportunity of being great Christians by becoming complacent or comfortable? And one, I would say that we constantly need to remember that our faith centers around a radical place of discomfort. And this is why the gospel drives what we do, because it's rooted in discomfort. Our lives have been built to living inside this nest, but the love of God pushes us from this nest. And we know we're alive because of discomfort, we're saved because of discomfort, and we're free because of discomfort. And it all hinges around this radical moment of discomfort. And Christ endured what was uncomfortable so that we could become sons and daughters of Christ. And people ask, people ask, what does it mean to be a Christian? People ask, what is the gospel? And so we tell them that we live the gospel the way that Jesus lived, that he exchanged his life to be crucified, to be dead and buried, and to be raised up on the third day, ascended into heaven, so that we can take so that we can take the Spirit of God living inside of us and take it out into the world. That is the gospel. That is what we believe. And it all hinges around a very uncomfortable moment. And sometimes, you know, on Sunday mornings, we get, we kind of lose focus on that. And sometimes we'll sing about the uncomfortable moments of Jesus while we sing in the comfortable moment of us. But when I come to Jesus, I don't thank him for this nest. I don't think, thank him for, for being comfortable. I thank him for stepping out into the valley and doing what I couldn't do. So that now, because of him, I can step out into the world with him and trust God, knowing that he's going to do great things in my life. The second way to stay away from comfort is first... We remember not only our faith centers around a radical place of discomfort, but that the point is to glorify God. I think maybe Peter 
wanted to stop at that. I think Peter thought, okay, if I'm going to die, I want to go to heaven. So, Jesus, I believe in you. I love you. Tell me to come out. Hopefully you won't say anything. That's what Peter was doing. I feel like Peter is us. I feel like we're, we're calling out to God because we think we're done. I think, you know, our time is coming, and so we call out to God and we say, God, we believe in you. This is, this is awesome. We love you so much. And uh, Jesus has a different plan for us. Jesus says, okay, Peter, you, you acknowledge me with your words. You, you glorify me with your words. Now glorify me with your actions. And I think that's what we need to do. I think that's the whole purpose of making war on complacency and comfort is that baptism is not the end goal. We get baptized, and that doesn't mean we're done. We get baptized, and that means we continue to fight on. And the third way uh, to deny comfort and complacency is to, re to remember that life is brief. You know, we don't see the end goal. And I think this is a funny one that we tend to forget, but we're not going to live forever. And so it's all about the end result. It's about glorifying God, understanding where we get our gospel, and then the end result. Jesus saw the end result when he stepped out of heaven. He saw the end to the burial, the resurrection, and he saw that it was going to bring all the glory to God. And so that's what we have to keep in mind, is that we're not going to live forever. We need to glorify God in all things we do, and we need to remember where we get our gospel from. We need to remember that it's not all comfort. Comfort is not the goal. The enemy is using that, that knowledge, human knowledge. We cannot see the end goal. If you guys can see when you're going to die or for the younger kids who you're going to marry, then, hey, that's awesome. But I don't think any of us can do that. And so the enemy is using that against us. Satan and his tactics are no better than an infomercial selling six-pack abs in 30 minutes. It's not going to work. We can't see the result. And Satan uses that against us. But what's funny is, is Satan's end result. Satan takes our sins, he takes our pride and our lust and all these things that, that we can't control, or we think we can't control, and he just shoves it in our face and he rubs it in and he tells us, you're done. And we think, maybe sometimes we think that is our end result. But Satan's end result is ultimately hell. Ours is not. God has far greater things for us. And so whenever Satan comes to us with these these lies saying, you know, your pride is too much to be stopped, your lust is too much to be stopped, and he's rubbing your face in it. All you have to do is just tell him, hey, Jesus told me to come to him, I'm coming to him, and God's going to take care of it. So, I, I think, I don't think Peter and the disciples knew what was going on as he stepped out and walked on the water. From Peter's viewpoint, he saw that he was sinking. He saw that the waves were crashing over him. He saw that he was done. The disciples, they saw a, a viewpoint. They saw that Peter was going to die. They thought, oh, we're about to lose one of our best friends. But Jesus' viewpoint was, Peter, I'm going to make you the rock of the church. You're not going to die right now. You're going to be the rock of the church. Our viewpoint is so different from God's. God has so much more in store for us than what we even know. We can't even begin to understand what God has in store for us because we can't see the end result. In studying for this sermon, I ran across a lecture from the porch at the Watermark Church uh, where JP, I don't know his last name, but he was given a lesson on Romans 8, and it's actually on my computer, but he brought up, if God is for us, who could be against us? And he turned it from saying, God is not on your team. It's, it's not saying, like, we're about to play pickup basketball and we're going to pick Michael Jordan and LeBron James on our team. We're good. We're going to win. It's not saying God is playing with us. But he said that God is the referee. God has already determined the outcome. And so we're playing this game knowing that we've already won. And so God determines the outcome of what's happening. And so it changes the story of 
where I said earlier where I felt like David, you know, we're fighting our giants of pride, lust, whatever it is, whatever our giants are that are tearing us apart. But it takes that story from David and God versus Goliath to David saying, yeah, you've got a big giant and I've got a giant. But it takes this story from, to, yeah, you've got a big giant, but my giant controls your giant. My giant has numbered his days. So God has already won the battle. We're just saying the battle belongs to the Lord, and it, it really does. And I want you guys to understand that. But David still had to go to the, to the lake. He still had to grab a pebble, and he still had to roll it around and throw it at that giant's head. God has already won the battle, but like David, we have to keep fighting. We have to move out of comfort. I mean, it's a big foot difference between David and Goliath. I mean, I'd be terrified to fight that guy. And so he did. And because David continued to fight, he, he ended up winning because God knows the outcome. God already has the end result, and we need to understand that. But... If you've heard this, you know, sin, God can't be around sin, right? So whenever we sin, we're not with God at that moment. And so you think, okay, well, God doesn't like that. Well, obviously, no, he doesn't like it. But that doesn't end your relationship. Your relationship with God continues every time. Because God has given us, th us this thing called grace, amazing grace. But when, when we sin, it strains our relationship with God, and it doesn't end it. So if you guys think that you're done, that, you know, you think maybe God is counting up to a million times that you sin, and once you hit that million mark, you're out, and like, there's no room for you in heaven, get out of that mindset. God is always with you. He is always asking you to get out of the boat. Jesus has the greatest comeback story ever. So if you think that you're done and you can't make a comeback, you're wrong. Jesus has the greatest story, and it's Jesus was born a man, yes. He was tempted, yes. He was killed on the cross, yes. He died and he sunk into the earth, yes. He was tempted, he defeated death, excuse me, yes. He heard God call his name and he rose from the dead, yes. Jesus has the greatest comeback story ever. Don't think that you're down and out with this sin. Continue to make war. You know, speaking for, staff, for the staff, we love you guys. We want to walk with you. That's why we have church. We, church is not a to-do list. It's not to wake up on Sunday and just check off. But we have church so that we come in without our Febreze and we tell each other what's going on. We fellowship with each other. And so... I love you guys. If you don't want to listen to anything I say, because I'm 23, go back to when Adam talked about pride. Just kidding. But uh, <laughs> we, we genuinely love you guys. We thank you for worshiping with us today. Um, I would ask that you guys would find our four seniors, wish them luck for next year, love on them, make sure that they know that when they physically leave North Point, they are not leaving spiritually. We will always back our seniors. So we're going to have some shepherds and some members of the staff come up and some prayer team members to come up and pray. Uh, so please come talk to us, and uh, we'd love to help walk you through this, this war that we're going to make.